So as uh, Monty Pythons would say, now th something completely different. Uh, but there are several links to the previous talk. One of them is that we also work on protein crystallography, but I will not be talking about it now. The goal of the presentation is really to highlight some of the facts and related information, motivation for uh, computationally predicting protein interactions uh, across the whole proteome. The motivation really comes from clinical studies, identifying prognostic and predictive signatures, and also from uh, drug-related studies trying to identify rationally, computationally uh, combination therapies that would work for specific patients. So the, the aspect of uh, workflow in a computational biology recently has been changing. We are accumulating more and more different kind of profiles, both on drugs, transcriptomes, epigenomes, proteomes, and so on. And we are building computational models through data mining and machine learning to identify better prognostic signatures and uh, predictive signatures, and then validating them on an independent data sets and by uh, additional methods, different methods. We then need to integrate multiple types of other information, including networks, uh, to ensure that the results are not only statistically significant, but also biologically relevant, and also to rationally plan further experimentation. Now, through all of these uh, networks, various kind of networks or metabolic interaction networks, uh, drug protein networks, microRNA, and so on, are essential, both to enable us integrate different types of information, but also uh, to enable us interpret this information and plan future experiments. Now, the challenge really comes from the fact that while we can improve signatures and find better signatures when we use this integrated network analysis, we can integrate data that is not otherwise uh, overlapping, for example, multiple prognostic signatures in lung cancer. We can also optimize, uh, for example, link of stem cell uh, differential genes in stem cell differentiation to prognosis in the leukemia and identify clinically relevant targets and potentially biological pathways and signaling cascades that might be of relevant for further studies, and eventually really leading into the computational modeling of these clinical, of these uh, signaling cascades. Now, the challenge really comes from that this integration is great if we have high and, and good, good, good data for this uh, integrative analysis. If we have limited information about these networks, and currently we have maybe only about 10% of the human interactive map, then we have really tunnel vision, and we only see what, in a sense, we are allowed to see through this. So if you take it into a context of, say, uh, sequencing studies, but you can apply to any proteomic or mRNA profiling studies, we ignore large fraction of the genome and proteome if we are focusing, for example, these uh, functional studies only on those where we have physical protein interaction evidence. So it clearly shows that the more we will have it, the more integrative and informative these studies will be. So as a further example of what does it really mean, imagine that you have a clinical study that identifies clinically validates 20 prognostic genes in lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. These are from cancer-associated fibroblasts, and those 20 genes would be interesting to study further why and what they mean, what can we learn from it. So if there would be unlimited funding and the labs would have an unlimited number of uh, postdocs, then uh, we can study all of these genes uh, in parallel. But under normal circumstances, we have to optimize. So you can look through other studies, you can look through the literature and try to prioritize which of these genes might be of most interest and hopefully the most success for uh, finalizing the study. The other very frequent and very useful approach is to actually map those genes into the network and try to study if there is any pathway or signaling cascade enrichment that might be worth uh, further elucidation that can also highlight what other methods or assays we would need to run. So those 20 genes from the prognostic signature are mapped into the proteins that are the squares on the outside. And not surprisingly, none of them directly interact. Why not surprisingly? Because if they would be interacting, likely there would be some redundancy here and we would have 19 or 18 gene signature, not 20. The other thing clearly shows is that except for one gene, all of them are connected to this uh, hairball in the middle. So that we can start inferring some information from it. Uh, the third information is that these red edges highlight indirect interaction, but basically highlight that any of these two 
proteins are connected through one shared interacting partner. Next, what is really interesting is that those shared interacting partners in the middle are highly interconnected, which are the blue edges. So this clearly shows that uh, most of these proteins, majority of these proteins from the signature are relatively closely on the interaction network. And what is also then interesting is that while on this level, gene ontology tells us that these are cellular fed and organization uh, proteins, on the interconnected level, we have a large fraction of genome maintenance protein. So it's starting to show us some additional biology that might be worthwhile exploring. So this is the analysis. This is one source of data. Well, what if you use different kind of single source of protein interaction data? The same type of analysis basically misses everything that I described so far. So while algorithm for the analysis is essential, but the data that you use for it is even more important. So you skeptics may highlight that, well, some of these interactions might be incorrect. That's possible, but likely not all of them. And what is important is that we have the clinical information as a validation that th there is some clinical relevance and need to study it further. And now we can validate these interactions in the context of lung cancer prognosis. Importantly, though, if we go into the next update of the integrated database, the story holds. Uh, we have the same uh, enrichment for uh, genome maintenance uh, proteins, similar kind of connectivity, only more edges. So this also highlights that while uh, it's useful to have more and more data, then we have to start to be concerned about algorithm scalability because we no longer can just look at these large hairballs. We have to start analyzing them. We have to have proper models for these analysis, and we have to have provenance and uh, care about data quality because some of these edges might be incorrect. We have to keep annotating them and moving forward, uh, improving our knowledge. So going into this in kind of global scale, it's true that over the years, we have been steadily increasing both number of proteins that have interactions and number of interactions for these proteins. Uh, we can debate, but it's pointless of how many interactions will be in a human proteome because uh, with co counting variants, it's, co it's going to be significantly more than that number. However, what is really critical is there is a large fraction of proteins that have no interactions, and we call them interactomorphins, and we had to do something about them because we cannot put them into this uh, workflow of integrate, integrative analysis. What is important is that they are related to disease, but they are very poorly annotated for disease. Uh, how do we know that they are, then they are related to disease? If you look through census, OMIM database, and also cancer data integration portal, those interactomorphins, up to 20% of them, are deregulated in multiple cancers. If you consider even the proteins with a low degree, which definitely they will have more interactions than that, uh, it's up to 60%. But there is also a very nice linear relationship across all of these data sets that the more degree the protein has, the more studied it is. And so increasing number of interactions will also increase potential that we will study those proteins. And we need really new methods to go where uh, current biases don't allow us to go. This is a very quick look over the last decade and a half in terms of how many new proteins have been added to the interactome and how many interactions among them were added. Uh, it's pretty much similar numbers except for a few outliers where significantly more interactions were added at a given time because usually new assay, biochemical assay, was introduced. I will return to this figure later on. Suffice to say that this is basically looking into what do we do with these interactomorphins once they cease to be interactomorphins? And if we kind of paraphrase from that, uh, the degree at the year of discovery is usually very low. And this is basically what's the degree in 2015 for those corresponding proteins in terms of median. And again, it nicely shows that there is this relationship that if the protein is available for several years uh, with interactions, it actually will gain more interacting partners. The more recent proteins usually have fewer interactions. But there are also some outliers from the past that people don't study no matter what uh, information there is. And there are many obvious reasons, for example, not having uh, good antibodies for those proteins or proteins being long and difficult otherwise. So a different view. Uh, we bind proteins into multiple different uh, groups based on degree, and what we tried to do was to have each been roughly similar size at the specific cutoffs of the degree. 
And this basically shows on the time scale from 70s until now, what is the number of this uh, discovery frequency for these proteins across the time. So again, it shows that there is this interesting trend that the low degree proteins are mostly discovered more recently. So we are discovering them, but not at the high frequency. This also shows the nice relationship in terms of the median year for the discovery. There are many reasons for it, and this is just one of them, that those low degree proteins, based on a degree different color, uh, are more recent, significantly, uh, and rich for more recent proteins, and actually they are deficient for proteins that are ancient. So even orthologous predictions are not going to help us here because these are mostly human or mammalian uh, proteins. And as I was alluding to earlier, uh, many of these proteins are related to disease. So we do have to study those proteins. So how can we solve the problem? And that relates to the paper. Uh, obviously, details are in the paper. But to really highlight uh, any machine learning or data mining approach, you have to have multiple phases from developing a training examples then collecting information on individual proteins. And the idea is to be as comprehensive as possible. So anything we can derive from the sequence, everything that we can de derive from uh, expression patterns for those proteins, domains, and so on, is included. Then we create combination of these features. And the reason is that many of the features are correlated. And we need to create useful information from combining non-correlated features. Then for each pair of the proteins, we combine additional information about the co-expression, about the information from uh, uh, topology in the networks. And combination of all of these features is then used to calculate the probability of interaction based on what are, is a training set of true positives interacting proteins and neg likely negatives. So other people use similar approaches, maybe not the same uh, frequent pattern matching algorithm, but there are other reasons why we obtain different results. Uh, one is that we created these feature sets and that enriched information about that can be used for the prediction. And the other is that we also focus on predicting non-interactions, which helps us to reduce the false discovery rate. So if you take the large number of these features and we combine them, you get a relatively nice figure in terms of the false positives, false negatives, and true positives. If you take any of the individual features, you can see that most of the features are useful up to a certain point, like topology, one of the most useful features. And then obviously it drops, because as soon as we go into, sorry, into the unknown or very sparsely connected network, uh, we don't have topological information that we can draw on. Gene expression and co-expression is very useful up front, but again, not for all of the proteins and predictions. So it's really the combination of this little piece of evidence across large fraction of these features and feature sets that enables us to gracefully degrade and have relatively good fraction of true positives in our predicted set. So how can we validate it further? So one of the interesting methods was to compare to uh, Vidal's group that combined five different biological assays for detecting 92 true positives and 92 true negatives and identifying each of these blocks uh, true positive identification and false positive. There are multiple reasons for uh, sensitivity and specificity of the assay uh, that leads to it. Also, there is no mass spectrometry here. There are no multiple runs on the assay that would increase the collection. But with the given set, what is really clear is that all of the methods detect relatively small number of interactions. If you take the whole uh, union of these, there are still 41% of true positives that are not detected. So the good news is that if we apply this uh, FP class prediction algorithm on the same set, we detect 90% of true interactions, and we have actually lower false discovery rate than these biological assays. It's a small set, true. When we go and try to revalidate on an independent set across different individual studies, we are beating other computational prediction algorithms in the true positives, and also in the false discovery rate is slower, smaller for us. And also on a combined data set, we are uh, having better performance than the other data sets. To validate it further, we work with three different labs and confirm biologically 137 interactions. But what is really interesting is that the rate of validation was from 83% to 40%, depending on which assay was used. So it's also clear that once you have prediction, you have to use biological validation. But depending on the biological validation and its biases, 
it may show uh, lower uh, validation rate, not because the prediction is wrong, but also because the assay is not as sensitive. Just to highlight that aspect. So now back to the orphans. Um, all of the green proteins in the middle are orphans. And what we can do now is one of the application is to associate them as prediction uh, into disease. So all of the red proteins are associated with the same disease. Green edges are predicted interactions. So this is a very good example because we have a lot of the predictions. Each of those predictions has some probability. But considering how strongly interconnected with known interactions are these proteins, we can also invert it because the chance that none of these green edges is true is extremely small. So this protein is really related to this disease, very likely. There are other possibilities that we can do now with this information because we can combine it with the other computational prediction. And again, as with biological assays, the, there is some overlap, but there is also a lot of novelty depending on which computational approach you use for the prediction, and there is a value to it. But when we combine it also then with uh, integrated data across the known interactions, now it starts to be really interesting because we have almost uh, over 800,000 protein interactions on about almost 18,000 proteins. What is also interesting is that orthologs are now really dwarfed. Uh, that's one of the smallest uh, addition to, to predicted interactions. What can we do now with that information? So in another paper with Igor Stagliar's group from Toronto, we looked into the predicting novel interactions uh, for EGFR, and we identified uh, not only EGFR-specific interactions that are on a lower side, but also interacting partners that are specific to the mutation that is very frequent in lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. Through additional analysis and through additional assays, we identified uh, CRK2 uh, protein, CRAC2, that expression of that protein and interactions with EGFR relates to response. And we were able to further validate it in, um, in cell line models that uh, it actually increases uh, allotinib sensitivity. So it opens potential for new uh, treatment options for lung cancer patients. Uh, let me skip through these examples so I can finish on time. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, this really opens a variety of analysis that we can do and modeling strategies. And as I was mentioning earlier, it's critical that scalable algorithms are used. Uh, there have been multiple talks on this conference and will be more on how you can use, for example, graphless then to analyze the structure of these large networks that are becoming bigger and bigger and identify some biologically and clinically relevant findings from it. So in conclusion, really, uh, there are multiple ways how we can use this information, but we can definitely improve identification of signatures and interpretation of them and planning uh, further experiments, but also improve and increase our understanding of how drugs work. What is true is that false positives are a problem, but data fusion usually enables us to reduce or diminish this problem, and false negatives really need to be and can be accessed by these multiple different methods. So I don't have time to go back to this example, but if anybody is interested, uh, I will uh, be happy to discuss it further. And so to finish, I would like to thank funding agencies and collaborators across different cancers, and I will be happy to take any questions if you have. These tools are available and resources are available uh, freely on the website. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Hi, Igor. Hi. Nice talk. Uh, could you uh, tell uh, what is the overlap of, of your study in the prediction with the Califano paper of the, a little bit more about the SAM paper in nature? Because it's also a predicted human interactome, no? So that was on a Venn diagram. Um, so there is some overlap. It's quite, it's quite small, I, I saw. It's, it's not huge, yes. And do you have a reason for that? Uh, as I was mentioning, it's the same thing when you take uh, biological assays. Also, the overlap is relatively small because each method has different biases or uh, focus on, on different type of information. Um, that's probably the, the simplest explanation. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>